Well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the College of Optical Sciences first colloquium of 2018. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Phil Pressel, um, to talk about the Hexagon Spy Satellite Program and put it in perspective of the time, some of the technology, some of the things that were going on. It's an amazing program. Uh, Phil got his bachelor's degree at New York University and then did a, a master's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, correct? Um, he worked at Perkin Elmer for 30 years where uh, a lot of the optics for the spy satellites were done. He uh, is semi-retired and uh, consults with Cordis Engineering in San Diego right now. Um, so we're going to talk about this spy satellite program. Now, Phil's actually written a book about the program, and he has a couple copies with him that he's willing to let go at his price, and he'll autograph them for you. So anybody's interested afterwards, um, they're, they're there. So to get going, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And the um, if you'll notice, I'm wearing a hat, a uh, Yukon. My wife and I, have, we've, we're from Connecticut. All this work that I'm going to talk about was done in, in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, we retired to San Diego. We are very big women's basketball fans. UConn is number one. They've been number one for a long, long time. And so the reason I wore it was because the best, op the number one optics school in the country, if not the world, is right here at U of A. So this number one. Um, and I've been, I want to thank John and Dave Wook and uh, everybody who's hosted me today. Uh, been very kind, sincere, great tours of, of everything. Okay, so my talk is going to be about uh, a specific spy satellite called the Hexagon KH9. Um, KH stands for keyhole, which is kind of a code word that the CIA came up with for overhead surveillance. Um, I worked at Perkin Armour. And um, um, uh, overhead intelligence, meaning from in a plane or, or space. Back during World War II, for example, there were reconnaissance planes, the B-29, the RC-130. You all know the story of the U-2 and the uh, flights over Cuba where the pilot was shot down and the, the SR-71. By the way, Perkin Elmer made the cameras for both the U-2 and the SR-71. And there's a movie, you may have seen it, The Bridge of Spies. It's with Tom Hanks. It's about interchange with Francis Gary Powers and Rudolf Abel, um, who were both captured, and, and they negotiated an exchange of, of, of uh, prisoners. It's a very good movie. And during the middle of it, for about three seconds, they do show the Perkin Elmer cameras on the bottom of the U-2. So uh, the problem with airplane reconnaissance is that you can only go so far and then have fuel to return. You can only take photographs of an airfield, for example, and that's about it. And you can make many trips to different airfields. Meanwhile, the enemy, let's say Soviet Union, uh, can fly the plane somewhere else and you'll never see them. So the advantage to orbital photography is that you can see a lot more, cover much more area. And the first uh, spy satellite was Corona, also the, run by the CIA. And its capabilities were, were not too great. The first 12 launches from um, the launch pads were failed. They blew up. Finally, they worked. They carried about 80 pounds of film, and the, the best resolution was 
the best could have been six feet, but mostly it was 10, 15, or 20 feet. And by resolution, I mean uh, if, if it could see uh, six, seven feet wide, that means they could see the outline of this table, and that's about it. No details about anything else. So then the, the Gambit program came along, also for the CIA, used by the NRO. The NRO is a National Reconnaissance Office. They own these satellites, and the photo interpreters who look at the final pictures work with them and, and two other agencies. Uh, before I, f I go on, okay, and then, then after Gambit, which was fairly good, came the hexagon. The reason I can talk about this now is that Hexagon ended, it started in 1965, it ended in 1986, and I'll tell you the story of the ending later. Um, but it wasn't declassified until 2011. That's why I can talk to you about it. So I did get permission to write a book about it. If you're really interested in how the thing works, you can get the book, no obligation. But anyway, so um, it was finally declassified in September of 2011 in Washington. I was there. It was a fantastic experience. It also happened to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the NRO. Okay. So the task of uh, Hexagon, the CIA came to us in 1965 because they knew Perkinama had experience with, with spy cameras. And they asked us to be able to take photos in stereo of the whole land mass of the Earth with resolution of specific targets, namely Soviet missile bases, tanks, sub, uh, shipyards, ships, airfields, where you could see, uh, have a resolution of about two feet from a hundred miles away, okay? Now, you may ask what, that's pretty good. The real resolution was a lot better. And I can't tell you how much better, but you take the hit. <laughs> so, um, okay, this turned out to be a very, very successful program. I was on it from the beginning. There were 30 of us. We, we did a study. Then we were asked by the CIA to write a proposal. Most proposals for companies today last one, two weeks. We had six weeks to write the proposal. And I and another fellow wrote the mechanical um, optical portion of the, of, of the program. We presented it. The CIA with their, with their consultants came to us at Perkinama in, in Connecticut, and we presented our design. The whole thing was very complicated. I'll show you it in detail in a minute. Um, so I presented the cameras, which is what I was responsible for, the design of the actual cameras. Other people designed the film system, the, the film path, complicated mechanisms. Um, and so at that meeting, was attended by very senior CIA people. Um, Edwin Land, who was the chairman of the President's Scientific Advisory Council at the time. Um, and he was the inventor of the Polaroid land camera. Brilliant guy. And we explained the whole system to them. One of the items that was key was the invention of a device called a twister, which allowed the cameras rotated constantly during photography. The film had to go by the focal plane. It went by extremely fast. As a matter of fact, at perigee, which is the closest point in the elliptical orbit, um, the film went by the focal plane linearly at a speed of 200 inches per second. 
meaning you could go from that wall to almost here in one second. That was very fast. At higher altitudes, it, it proportionally ray, uh, came, became uh, slower, but not that slow. And the film had to go by also in rotation, perfectly in sync with the rotating image. And this twister, uh, I'll explain it briefly, but it's very hard to explain. So we did explain it to the CIA and, Paul and Land and, and the others. After the meeting, my colleague who invented the twister and I took him down to the lab to show him this device. And Edwin Land happened to be loved gadgets and inventions and things because he was himself an inventor. And he was blown away by this thing. And I think his influence with the president and the government had a great deal to do with the fact that we won the job sometime later. Um, okay, so we won the job in, in um, October of, of 1966, okay? And as soon as we got the, the, the job, those of us, there were 30 of us, the first thing we had to do was to hire staff. Eventually, several years later, the staff that supported the Hexagon program went over a thousand people. So we were all asked to start interviewing engineers and managers and quality control people. And we all wanted to get down to, to business, do design and, and fun stuff. Now you had to interview people. So I eventually hire, um, interviewed with the, a guy who would become my own boss. And I came up with some clever mechanical engineering questions about mounting mirrors or something. And he knew more than I did. So he became my, eventually my boss and director. But it, it was, it was a, a task. What happened to these people? In order to be on the job, you had to pass a security clearance, which meant the FBI had to investigate you. And they came to your neighborhood and asked about you in those days. And so we had to keep them occupied. So some of them, depending on their skills, we were able to uh, give them sanitized, non-classified work to do. Others, they read a newspaper or they just hung around. We put them in a large room with dozens and dozens of desks. And we called this room the tank because that's where they were held until they got their clearances. Clearances took anywhere from four months to a year. And you could not tell them when they started, this is what you're going to work on. You couldn't tell them it was a spy satellite or anything. So they did run a risk that if they didn't pass the security clearance, they, they wouldn't be hired. Uh, they'd be let go. We had another key word for this t room called the tank. It was called the mushroom patch. Why? Because we... The, we kept them in the dark and fed them a lot of crap. <laughs> okay. So, um, and, uh, so the Hexagon was the last film-based reconnaissance camera. I'll show it to you in a second. Um, now the KH-11 is a digital camera that's above there and, and taking photographs. Uh, Hexagon is still the best photography satellite ever because film takes better pictures than a zillion pictures on your iPhone. Um, okay, so we started in 66. We got the contract then. It ended in 1986. Okay, this is an isometric uh, um, uh, drawing of, um, is this the... Uh, Point to, yeah, okay. So this satellite was the size of a 60 foot long truck. It weighed 30,000 pounds. It had solar arrays. And, and this is a, 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 an artist's concept, but it's pretty good. There were electronic controls in the back. This sat on top of a Titan 3D rocket. 
it was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base because the launches from uh, Florida are mostly equatorial orbits. So you've got the Earth slightly tilted, and as the Earth rotates, an equatorial orbit kind of makes a sine wave around the equator. Um, but a polar orbit, which you can do from Vandenberg, uh, as the Earth turns, you're going to cover every square foot of Earth. So most spy satellites do a polar orbit. Okay, so, so the, there were two cameras. Here's one camera, here's the other camera, and two reels of film. Okay, and these reels of film are kind of close together. Do you want to guess how, many, how much film was on each camera? 30 miles of film on each camera, and it was both black and white and color interspurts, and the, the controllers knew exactly when the color would show up. Um, so there were 30 miles of film. The film was 7.1 inches wide. The actual images were on a 6.6 .6 inch uh, area. And the quarter of inch on e either side was, we used fiber optics back in those days to have a data stream implanted on the edges of the film, giving the date, the location, the, the orbit, uh, whatever information was necessary on the film. OK, so 30 miles of film. Uh, so it, the film on each camera went through, through the uh, focal plane area, which I'll show, show you. And then it, it was all, all sent back to the four reentry vehicles. This was RV number one, launched first. So the film went through each of these vehicles, filled up the first bucket, we called them a bucket, and when it was full, there was a potentiometer that told us it's full. It was, the, the film was cinched onto the second bucket, cut, and released into the atmosphere. It would re-enter the atmosphere in a re-entry vehicle, just like the astronauts used to come back through the atmosphere. And at 50,000 feet, a parachute would open up, and a C-130 uh, um, airplane would catch it. I'll show you how later. OK. So all right. So I mentioned the challenge was to improve the resolution to two to three feet compared to corona. We had to map the whole landmass of the Earth in stereo. Stereo meant that when we took a photograph of, say, a missile base, and I'll show you one, uh, all the pictures I'm going to show you are declassified and all that, but they're not great photographs because the really good ones with the good resolution are still sensitive and the NRO won't release them. I have some, but, but th th some, you'll see how good they are. They're not, they're not bad. OK, so um, all right. And we returned four capsules of film. When the whole, all the film was, was done and the four reentry vehicles were finished, the vehicle, the whole vehicle, was deorbited deliberately burned up through the atmosphere and destroyed and the particles fell into the ocean. Uh, we had very, very high reliability, backed up everything. We minimized film wastage and I, and I mentioned the, the, the mushroom patch to you. Um, if I have time, I'll talk about security, which was very, very tight about how we travel and all we had special phones and if I have time, I'll talk about that. OK, there were some difficulties. Uh, we had to maintain alignment of the camera and focus during orbit and during temperature changes. We did temperature control the vehicle, but up to a point. And just imagine, when you're launching a vehicle, you have sinusoidal, you have random vibration, you have maximum dynamic pressure. 
and the worst lows are random vibration. So if you if you plot the power spectral density versus frequency curve, the area under the curve is a, the approximate G's RMS that the vehicle and the camera will see. And you multiply that by a factor, a delta, um, of, um, a, a factor of safety of three. So if, if the curve said nine, nine G's, I designed, we designed things for 27, really 30 G's in three directions, but not simultaneously. Okay, so after surviving launch, nothing broke, right? You had to maintain the lenses and the mirrors in perfect alignment every single time. And we did. And so just imagine, you have the Earth rotating, you have the satellite going at around the Earth at 17,000 whatever miles per hour. You have the cameras, which I'll show you, which are rotating constantly during photography. If we were going over neutral territory, we didn't take pictures and save film. And you had the film going by. So you have image motion problems. And I'm sure some of you are t learning about image motion compensation. So like you're taking pictures of, of a racehorse, if you don't move along perfectly with them, you're going to get smear. So we did solve that problem. We were, okay, so we had 19 successful missions. Uh, okay, as a result of these photographs, <coughs> President Nixon was able to sign the SALT Treaty, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, before you, all of you were, most of you were born. And when President Reagan was president, he was same, famous for saying, trust the Russians, but verify what they're doing. Well, these cameras verified what everybody was doing, not just the Russians, but whoever. Um, and so this satellite was put out some fantastic photographs, imagery, I'll show you a bit. And it basically was a major reason for keeping the peace during the Cold War, 1970s and 80s. So it's, it's really incredible. And there were no failures. And it's still known as the most complicated satellite ever put up for any reason. And the reason it was so complicated is we, because we had 30 miles of film times two going over a very, very complicated path. And the film, OK, here's a roller that, that I brought. It's a souvenir. This is, we had a, well over 100 of these rollers in the system. And I will show you that. And the film had to go over all of these in various directions. And, and this created a lot of talk. There were bearings on each side, and they rotated and all, and all that. Um, so they, we had to save weight. You know, every pound means something when you're launching a vehicle. So these were made out of beryllium. Probably not too many people are familiar with beryllium, but those of you who are, it's, it's probably the, uh, has the highest uh, stiffness to weight ratio of any metal. It's 70% it's of the weight of aluminum. Um, and it has a very high uh, stiffness coefficient. And it's very strong. And then we gun drill these to make them hollow. So they weigh almost nothing. It's like a feather. Of course, and I use, I use a lot of beryllium on this program because it's of its stiffness properties, and it was a great datum from which to, to mount mirrors. The problem with beryllium is that it's expensive. Aluminum today costs probably $1.50 a pound. I'm not sure exactly what. Beryllium costs about $1,000 a pound, and we use a lot of them. So... You should ask how much this program cost. It's a lot. It was a lot in those days. OK. So this is me in front of the only satellite left in the world, which we built 20 of these, but we built 21. One of them was an exact replica. It was called the development model. We used it 
to perform tests in our facility in a big high bay clean room simulating any problems we might have in orbit with the film transport system or anything at all and it was eventually upgraded and and uh, after the program was declassified in 2011 it was shipped it was at the it was in washington so i got to see it again it was shipped to the uh, United States Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It's on exhibit there. It's in Building 4. I've spoken there several times to an audience and in front of the vehicle. Um, if you go to my blog, uh, you can see it. Uh, it's a YouTube. You can see two films, one of me doing this. Um, uh, my blog is www. Um, one word, hexagon kh9.com if you uh, anyway it's, it's all free you can whatever anyway so I'm pointing to the vehicle it was almost upgraded could have flown if necessary with some more upgrades but and and we wrote a proposal to do that and it was not approved for some re crazy reasons and the, the security agencies today are very sorry it was never implemented because it could have been of great use to, for example during the desert storm wars in Iran and and other places but it wasn't it wasn't approved okay so that's the real system um, okay these are the two cameras there was a huge frame 10 feet by 10 feet I don't know, not exactly but um, and I, I, so these are the two cameras. This is camera A, this is camera B, and there's the entrance window of the light coming from Earth. The cameras were tilted at 10 degrees. They're looking down now at the Earth. And they were 10, 10 degrees and 10 degrees. So one looked forward, one looked aft, thus creating the stereo effect. So eventually, the photo interpreters at the CIA had to redo all of their light tables because they were used to mono and much smaller scans. I'll tell you about the scans shortly, but they had to redo their light tables 10 feet long, two of them, and then use a stereoscope to look and synchronize the, the, the images. And uh, so, but they got so much data, they were all totally overwhelmed. And so these cameras, they were about six feet long, uh, about 30 inches in diameter, and that long, and they both rotated uh, against each other, as did every other major rotating assembly. So you had the two film reels, and these film reels, each one of them weighed about 1,500 pounds. And so one rotated this way, the other one rotated that way. The, the, the other the take-up reels, everything that had a ma major mass rotated in opposite direction. Would any of you engineering students care to say why? Opposite? What? Momentum compensation. If you, you know, action, reaction, if they both went the same way, the vehicle would wobble all over the place. Good. Okay. So, so anyway, so we also had... Uh, this is the focal plane area. I will talk about that. These two boxes were called loopers. They were another invention that stored film. We had enough film. The distance between the supply reel and the take-ups was about 120 feet. And we always had approximately 120 feet in these devices so that we could instantly take pictures if necessary with a full scan. I'll explain that soon. Okay. That is the 30,000 pound vehicle. We shipped our camera and film path system from Danbury, Connecticut to the West Coast to Lockheed. It wasn't Lockheed Martin. In those days it was Lockheed. And I'll show you the container that it, it was shipped in. The only airplane in the world that could carry such a large load was the C-5A, at the time the largest plane in the world. Um, 
So it was shipped to Lockheed in Sunnyvale, California, where they integrated our camera system, the film, camera system, the, re the buckets and the reentry vehicles. They integrated the reentry vehicles themselves that were made by McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. And the film was supplied by a small company you may never have heard of called Kodak. And they made, they, I think they made a lot of money from all the film that they supply. So they integrated everything at Lockheed in a huge high bay area. And they also tested, we did, we, we actually tested the, the cameras uh, in vibration. This 600 pound camera, six feet long, is in vibration, very severe, unbelievable noise. And we did thermal tests. We did optical tests before and after every other thermal or vibration tests. And some of these were repeated on the West Coast. They had a huge thermal vacuum chamber where the, the vehicle went in horizontally. And I was out there many, many times. And normally it was, its configuration was on the ground like this. And I did work on it. I did reports and stuff. One time I had to do something special that I w was knowledgeable about. And it was vertically and they had a scaffold around the whole thing. So I had to climb up the scaffold um, at least 50 feet up to uh, this area. There was a wind, there was a, uh, there were covers here that was off. So I lay down on a diving board and I had a technician right next to me handing me tools and I reached in and as I reached in, every, all my tools were tethered except one, a C-clamp. And I dropped it. Oh my God, we're in real trouble here. Luckily, the film canisters, they were huge cans, were not there. So we looked down and we, it, we saw the clamp lying on the curved aluminum surface of the bottom. So we said, we have to get it. So I had, I had the, the technician went and he got lacing cord, you know, many feet of it and a big magnet and we went fishing <laughs> and he's holding it up and I go like this and thank God I got it Whew. and we never told anybody <laughs> <laughs> we never told anybody until the declassification happened uh, in 2011 my director was there and a few other people at the ceremony and that's when I told him and he burst out laughing <laughs> okay all right so okay this is another view of the satellite you can see the bucket number th three and four you can see here see the two cameras tilted at 10 degrees each so you had a 20 degree stereo angle these pneumatic tanks contained dry nitrogen gas at 3,000 PSI pressure, and their purpose was to supply air to the film path. The film could not be in a vacuum because the, the, um, the humidity would be lost and the, um, uh, reflecting the, the surface of the film would also be destroyed. So the whole film path was in, a, in an enclosed set of tubes. And they were pressurized with about one PSI of nitrogen that was enough. And so that supplied the gas for that and for the twister, which I'll talk about soon. OK, now, as an aside, you see this window here. This was for the, the, the last four vehicles that were, okay, this, the, sat, the first satellite was launched in, in June of 1971. That was mission number one. Mission number two was launched a couple of months later. And then there were two or three missions per year for the first couple of years. And then as the reliability became so good, we extended the missions and the government decided, so we eventually lo launched one every six months or seven, eight months. The longest surviving one was 800 and 275 days. So we had fewer launches as, it, as time went by. 
So for the last for the last four launches, we I, I happen to be uh, in charge of the, of the design of another sensor. I think it's and it and that sensor, which I'll talk about in a second, was aim it was called a Star Tracker. It aimed through here at the sky, and there was one on the other side. So you had two sensors looking up at the sky. That's the if I have it. Oh yeah, that's it. Okay, and th this sensor was about this big and it was the precursor of star trackers and the fine guidance system used for the Hubble Space Telescope. It used, this was initial technology and it used uh, mirrors, lenses and, and, a, and a cryogenic cooler for the IR focal plane. You know, IR works best at cold depending on the wavelength and wh what you're actually doing. And so this camera was mounted at those two places looking at the stars. The computer had a star map in it. And so this looked at the stars and it sent a signal to the controllers to aim the hexagon satellite and eventually the FGS, uh, the, 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 the four FGSs on the Hubble aimed the Hubble extremely accurately. So this looked at the stars that could aim the hexagon so accurately that if you had a rifle in New York City, you could hit a tennis ball in San Francisco. That calculate that in micro radians. Okay, so okay, okay. So here's the here's the hexagon uh, right up there on the on the Titan 3D. For the last third, uh, last seven eight missions. It was launched on the Titan 34D, which was a, still the most powerful rocket other than the Apollo. Okay. Here's a picture. This is a lousy picture of Shea Stadium in New York. If it was any good, you could see the t seats, which were, you know, two feet. As I said, you could see something two feet. This is an old lousy picture. I don't like it, but I'm showing it anyway. Here's a picture of the Leningrad, Leningrad shipyard which uh, you can see a lot more detail here. How am I doing for time? Okay. All right. Here's a picture of St. Louis and Bush Stadium, the arch. Not too bad. I have a picture, yeah, of my home that I, I chose my car in the driveway in a lot more detail, but I can't show it to you. Okay. So, okay, I live in San Diego. My wife and I live one block from the bay in a high-rise condo. And, and this picture was taken by Hexagon in 1982. And here's the Broadway Pier. This is Broadway in San Diego. This is the B Street Pier. And this is the railroad. And I live now. There's one after the other after the other high-rise condos, you know, 39, 40 feet, um, stories up, I live right there, and it was barren. It was, no, there was nothing there. So that's where I lived, lived. And now we have the, you've heard of the Midway aircraft carrier. It's a museum, it's wonderful. It's docked right here permanently. And right next, there's a park right here with a statue of Bob Hope and a tape of all his jokes to the troops. There's dozens of statues of troops. And there's the famous 1945 picture of the sailor kissing a nurse in Times Square. There's a 10-foot high statue right there. If you come to San Diego, please look at it. Okay, so this is a schematic of the whole system. Again, 60 feet long. Here are the two film rolls, one in back of the other. Here's the, the film path that was, that was uh, pressurized. This is the looper, and it went down to the platen, and then the photography was taken. Here's camera A looking forward, the flight direction. Here's camera B looking aft. When it ended, I finished photography. And we had a, uh, oh, by the way, okay, all right. Uh, then the film was sent back through the exit side of the looper and went to the first bucket, etc. I'll talk a little more about these things. So these are the two cameras. Here's one. 
is the other. They were 30 inches in diameter, six feet long. Here's the entrance window. It was one inch thick, BK7. It was an A-sphere. you optics guys, right? You all know about optics. So, so this was an A-sphere. It, it, uh, the the, the um, camera was an F3, folded right, 60-inch focal length camera. So the aperture was 20 inches. That was the aperture diameter. And um, focal plane area. And everything was either polished, shiny with an emissivity of 0.1 or less, or black for optical reasons and thermal reasons. And these are the pressure vessels again. Okay. All right, here's the film path. Very complicated. It went from the supply reels through an exit vestibule, through, okay, it, it, this is better. The two film reels were on um, 15 or 16 inch centers. Here's one reel, here's the other reel. The cameras called optical bars were on 30 inch centers. So the film had to come off the supply and make a left or a right hand turn and go around and then go down the rest of the of the way to the rear entry vehicles. So how do we do that? We had we had rollers we had longer rollers than this at an angle with holes in it which and the air air the, the point, one PSI air came out so that the film rode on a film of air. Okay? And it wouldn't scratch. When the film was going linearly over we didn't need the air. Okay. All right, so, so then the film went through the looper. The looper consisted of a carriage, and the carriage moved. Let me see. I think I have a picture of the looper. Let me go ahead quickly. Yeah, there's the looper. Okay. So the looper had a carriage that moved left and right, and it had rollers, and there was... These moved back and forth, and here were the, here's the film coming from the supply, going over the rollers. When the carriage moved to the left, it drew in up to 120 feet of film. And as it moved to the left, okay, and, and, it, and then it, it sent the film to the platen. The platen was the focal plane area with lots of instruments. And after photography, the film came back to the exit side of the looper so so that when this went that way it would send the fo the film that was already used up to the reentry vehicles so in comes the film out goes the exposed film already okay i'm going to talk a lot more about that but let me go back Okay, so, all right, so the film went through the system and went back and then went to the reentry vehicles. This is the can, uh, almost eight feet in diameter. Uh, the film actually was six feet in diameter. The reels of film, it, it was on a, on a beryllium core with motors and, uh, and encoders, and it was huge. And this, this, aluminum can held the film and it was pressurized so that the film never saw a vacuum and the film came out here and here and here's a stack of film okay and it was okay so here's the looper I may go back to it okay here's the camera all right so this was about six feet long 30 inches in diameter. The light came through this A-sphere corrector plate. It hit a 45 degree mirror, uh, angle mirror, sent the light to the primary mirror, which was a sphere. And then that mirror was focused through four lenses. Eventually we had a fifth element in there, which was a filter that was on a that was on a, it could shift 
to, to have two different filters for color, and we put that mechanism in there later. I don't show it here, but so we, we go through all the lenses, and there's the focal plate right there. This area here was called the platen. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, okay, so the the mirrors were held at three points. You, you, as you all know, you can't hold uh, any optic at more than three points because it's, uh, it's not um, flat. So we had flexures, and we mounted them. Uh, I, I, I'll be able to show you the mount. Um, so there was a 60-inch focal length from the vertex to the focal plane. How do you control the focus during temperature changes? We use metering rods. So um, the mirror was held axially at three points in back of the mirror. And the, its load was through this meter. There were three of these metering rods, equally spaced, 120 degrees apart. And they went to this bulkhead I mentioned before. It was beryllium. It was the datum. So on the left side of the bulkhead was a slug of aluminum about that long. And it was tied to the metering rod, which was made out of invar, whose coefficient of expansion is very close to that of most glasses. And it's very low. It's like point, uh, few silica is 0.3 parts per million per degree F. Invar is 0.7. Aluminum is 12. Stainless steel is 6 to 9, etc. And so the remaining 5 feet was invar. So as, as the mirror expanded this way, it was brought back by a short slug of a aluminum expanding the other way an equal amount. So that kind of explains metering rods. Um, okay. All right. This is the difficult part. This is the, the twister and the uh, an isometric of it. Okay. So first of all, Let's assume I'm the camera, and I'm looking at Nader. Okay, so here's Nader. So we could take photographs plus or minus 60 degrees. So that was a 120 degree scan for every degree was equivalent to one inch of film. So you talk about 120 inches, a 10-foot long frame. Okay, we use those kinds of frames to map the world, to map Russia, for example. We, we in several revs, we could take all, all the all the photographs of of a certain area of land, and then and they were stitched together, and they produced large film, uh, actual photographs, 10 feet long, this feet this wide. Okay. We also had the capability of doing very short scans. We could do plus or minus five degrees. We could, we could do plus or minus 30 degrees or whatever. So the controllers of the orbit and the satellite knew when it was going to go over a Russian missile base. And they knew its latitude, longitude exactly, and it was going to be over there. So we would aim the cameras and take scans of those. They could be short scans. And again, the cameras rotated constantly during photography. So we were able to see basically all of Russia, what their military assets are. That reminds me, in addition to all the military assets, we were able to do economic intelligence, meaning we could look at the farm fields of Russia or any other place and see how fertile they were. We could look at their water plains. That gave the United States a lot of information about their crops, about their status financially. We knew this was a good year or a very bad year. And that would help strategy 
for the government. Uh, so, so that was another capability that could be done. All right. So, so anyway, so, so for 100, I'm not playing golf. So for the 120 degree scan, we'll just talk about that one for a minute. The way the twister worked, I'll use a modern tool. Uh, oh, I have a, oh, talking about technology. We did all of this work, again, very complicated, in the 1960, late 60s, early 70s. We did not have microprocessors, LEDs, CCDs, fancy, co fancy FEA programs. We didn't have Code 5. We didn't have um, um, ZMAX. I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. And we had no computers, basically. So how did we do all this complicated stuff? You see this? You know what this is? <laughs> we didn't use them. We didn't use abacuses. But we use a slide rule. Have you ever seen a slide rule? Some of you probably never heard of it. This is a slide rule. We could do all our calculations, logarithms, division, everything. We did it all with this until the early 70s when we eventually were able to get pocket calculators. Can you imagine that? OK. While I think of it, how did we control? I, I, I'm going to explain the, the twister. but. Uh, every rotating part had to have a motor. And in space, you want to be, for an optical instrument, you want to be very, very clean. Cleanliness is so important. You have things like outgassing. I don't know if you know what outgassing is, but it's sublimation of particles coming from materials that are not space qualified. So the motors, for example, had to be brushless DC motors in line. So the, here's, here's the camera or the supply. The motor was in line with it. and It, it was direct torque in rotation, no backlash, nothing. Brushless because brushes to commutate a motor causes dirt, chips and stuff. Impossible. You cannot have that. Murphy's Law says a piece of dirt will go right onto the middle of the lens and Add brushes cause EMI, electromagnetic interference. So we, we did everything um, with brushless DC motors. So how did we commutate them? The, the camera, the optical bar, had a, they all did, had an encoder, an optical encoder, which contained uh, two disks with barcodes, just like you go to the shopping, that kind of barcode. All equations of the guidance of the vehicle, the control of the film, the position of things. We could position the film within several microns of, of, of the focal plane, and they have, uh, the actual image. Um, so uh, it had to be extremely accurate. And so these barcodes, we invented basically the brushless DC motor. I didn't, but the company did. And and encoders to commutate the equations to, 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 to rotate the motors at whatever speed was required. And, as, uh, as some, and the elliptical orbit, maximum speed was at perigee, minimum was at apogee. And as the orbit changed, the equations all had one term that was the same for every single mission. And that was V over H, the velocity of the vehicle going around the Earth at whatever point, divided by the altitude of, of the Earth at nadir below it. And that term entered every single equation to control the film. And I give so much credit to the servo engineers who designed <coughs> the servo system. It was closed loop. Oh, 10 minutes? OK, all right, I'll be going. Anyway, so basically what happened was Here's, here's the film, and this is a roller. It goes over two rollers that were the twister. These were rollers were sh shaped like the le le letter D, had holes in them, so the film went around 
that on a film of there and and so there was an entrance D bar and an exit D bar they went through these are the focal plane rotors that's the vertex of the last element that's the focal plane that's the film there and there was a fixed roller so so all the, the optics is rotating remember that from here on these two rollers and all of these twisted so they would it's a light okay so the camera's going around let me get out of the light okay okay so those assemblies I'm going to do a 120 degree scan they scanned they took pictures at a hundred and at plus 60 degrees the camera kept going the film was stopped in microseconds reversed the whole platinum assembly went back the film was sent during that time to the re-entry vehicles and so photography recycle photography recycle through the twister which allowed the film to go over over this because and as this twisted the film rode up and down and it did so on a film of air so it didn't destroy the film so the twister was key because it allowed at the focal plane the film is moving very fast it's moving and it's also curving around and in in my book is the patent of the twister and if you want more details look at the book I don't have time now and it's really hard to explain okay any questions <laughs> all right so let me go, quickly move on these are the four re-entry vehicles so the the film came in went through each one it was cinched here when it became full uh, the film was cinched onto this roller uh, it was cut here right there with a guillotine cutter cut and this was sent back to earth etc Okay, this is the vehicle in the C5, that's a C5A plane holding a temperature humidity controlled white container for all of what we did. Shipped to Sunnyvale. Here's the C130 plane. You can see the trapeze underneath it that caught the parachute. Okay, hauled in the parachute and the reentry vehicle and brought it, this was over the Pacific, brought it to Hawaii, was sent, sent back to the East Coast. Uh, one of the parachutes did not deploy, it was faulty, the thing hit, it went down 16,000 feet of depth of the Pacific Ocean. The CIA wanted to recover it because this mission had, had extraordinarily weather and good pictures and, uh, and they wanted to recover it and they hired the Navy and Perkin Armour to recover it. Also because there were always Russian trawlers around. They didn't want the Russians to capture it. So we did, we did to make the, the, do, do, the, do it. And this is a picture of the f whole film, the bucket film assembly on the bottom of the ocean, 16,000 feet deep. It, it hit at really high Gs. So um, it turns out we, we designed this huge clamp to bring it up. We did bring it up, the film all unraveled, and no data came out of it. It, was, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen, but that's the way it goes. The last mission, you all heard of the Challenger blowing up in 1986 and uh, killing seven astronauts. Well, the last hexagon, Mission 20, did the same thing from Vandenberg. It exploded 1,000 feet above the pad. There were no, no body. It was hurt. There's no one on its unmanned mission. And when I found out about it, that right as soon as it happened, I cried. It was, it was very difficult. So, okay, let me just show you some photographs. This is a submarine base in, um, in Russia. This is a, a Russian aircraft carrier. This is Moffett Field in Sunnyvale, where, we, where the C-5A landed to deliver it to Lockheed, which is right nearby. Okay, here's the missile base in Russia. So you can see, here's a launch pad. 
there's a gantry, there's another launch pad, and this is not a great picture, but using stereo, we could measure the heights of these things. So that was a, an important mission, but you know, I can't show you a better picture. And this is a radar station in Russia. This is Moscow. Um, I'm sorry, this is Boston. No, no, this is Moscow. This is Moscow, yeah. The next one is Boston. This is Manhattan, Lower Manhattan when the Twin Towers were still up. The Brooklyn Bridge. Here's a Russian airfield. So we could actually count the number of planes in one shot that they had. Not like the airplanes during World War II, which you couldn't count on how many there really were. And, and my, last, my last view graph is a, a very highly classified study that was just released a few months ago that I participated in with an astronaut and two other people in, behind closed walls, really secret. And that was, could, this was in 1973, I think it was, could the, sh the hexagon vehicle, once it used up all its film, be recovered by the shuttle, put into the shuttle, brought back to Earth, and refilled with film and fuel and gas and all of that. And we were part of that, and we, I designed a pallet to interface with the, the hexagon and the shuttle, and the shuttle, it would, could have been done. The, the hexagon was this shorter than the, than the bay. Height was no problem. It could have been done, and for some reason, the government decided not to do it, and to the chagrin now, they wish they had. Okay, any qu that's about it. So, any questions? Thank you.